Okay, folks. Uh, good evening. Um, welcome to uh, another uh, another installment of the Saint John Ambulance uh, Division One Seventy Six uh, uh, Lecture Series. Uh, this is uh, our, we had a bit of a slow start to the year. This is our second lecture of the year. Um, as uh, as you guys uh, probably all know, my name is Nick Hume. I'm a provincial staff officer with Saint John Ambulance here in. Uh, here in Victoria. I'm uh, based in Victoria. I do most of my work with Division 176. Um, joining us tonight, we have uh, Chris Ross. Uh, Chris is a paramedic in uh, Vancouver with uh, extensive experience uh, working in the downtown east side and working with, uh, with folks who are, uh, um, would otherwise be called marginalized or, uh, or, or you know, in, in disadvantaged situations. And he's going to be talking about uh, how to provide those folks with with good and meaningful care in a way that uh, that is helpful to them moving forward. Go ahead, Chris. Uh, hi, my name is Chris Ross, and as Nick said, I'm a PCP who works out of the downtown east side in Vancouver. I'd like to thank Nick for inviting me to speak this evening. And the quick disclaimer: my views are my own, and I do not represent my employer while I'm speaking here. This is all on me. Uh, Today is International Women's Day, and I'd like to extend uh, thanks to women healthcare providers and educators. Uh, they make our service and our uh, organizations what they are and uh, improve us all. So thank you very much. Um, and before I begin, I'd like to also start with an acknowledgement of territories. Uh, I would like to acknowledge that I'm speaking from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Coast Salish people, the Squamish, Sahalit, and uh, Musqueam nations. So, so the downtown east side and comprises of many different vulnerable populations. Uh, people from different backgrounds and people with different experiences. Uh, these groups contain uh, the indi uh, Indigenous peoples, um, the unhoused trans folk, people who use the IV drugs, and people with mental health conditions, amongst others. One thing that all these people have in common with each other is that they are experts on their own lived experiences. So as healthcare providers, we are professionals in our own fields, but we may not know what it means to live as a different group and have different hardships that come along with it. And in my experience and my practice in general, I find it critical for patients to feel like they are heard and they're not being spoken down to. While receiving some conflict resolution training, one of the key points that was made to me is don't make people feel like they're being social worked or make them feel like they've lost control over their situation. It leads to people shutting down and not sharing critical information with you because they don't think you're listening. And a lot of the time, healthcare providers aren't really listening to what people are saying. They're, they're looking for clues, they're looking for signs and symptoms, they're looking for critical pieces of information. And while those are important, if you, when people are seen as a, a, a collection of problems rather than actually people with lived experiences, um, we miss out on a lot. And let your patient speak with you. <laughs> you don't need to cut them off. You don't need to cut them short unless it's an acute medical crisis. And a lot of the times dealing with vulnerable, po vulnerable populations is not necessarily a crisis. There are things that require medical attention, require transport or require, or require some intervention. But if the wind's not gonna fall off, the heart's not gonna stop, then maybe you can take some time and actually understand this person and why they're here. Um, so it is obviously really important to promote all sorts of equality in your field, uh, speak out against sexism, racism, homophobia, transphobia, but it is also important to watch how your coworker, you and your coworkers speak about marginalized communities while representing the healthcare field. So while you're wearing a uniform or providing care, um, if you, uh, and if you and, or people you are speaking with seen, are seen to disregard a community, members of that group will remember it and will color their entire experience. It takes all day to build a positive relationship with someone, but a single word or look or glance that goes undefended or uncontested that can shake trust in an institution. Uh, there's, there's no slide here, it's just, uh, just me talking, so uh, bear with me. <laughs> so I'm gonna be speaking, um, I'm gonna be focusing on a couple of groups that I see represented a lot in the downtown east side and speak to some special concerns for each group and providing care to them. Uh, there are, as I'm sure you all know, there are many unhoused people in the community which I work. Um, it's particularly easy for people to end up in this situation, especially with rent being as high as in Vancouver. This population group has a lot of specific concerns 
and issues that arise from not having a place to live. Uh, something that honestly surprised me was the high presence of uh, pneumonia in the, in the unhoused community. I was warned about street foot, which is honestly an issue, but the big thing I've encountered a lot of is pneumonia. Uh, and lacking uh, proper treatment, this can develop into a chronic condition, which can plague a person for a long time, and also spread to a lot of other people in the community. Having a wet cough and wandering around all day, and going to bed in a shelter where you're sleeping in a room with, well, pre-COVID, 40 or 50 people, it's very easy for that to get transmitted. There's also occasionally cases of pneumonia, not, or not pneumonia, sorry, tuberculosis, not as often, thankfully, but occasionally they do pop up. There is a treatment area in VGH specific for pneumonia or, or uh, <laughs> tuberculosis patients, including uh, mandatory uh, isolation. So it is something to keep your eye out for um, and also give a chance to auscultate, <laughs> take the chest chance, any, take any chance you get to auscultate a chest, take a listen, listen for those wet crackles at the bases um, you'd be surprised how often it comes up. Uh, and another thing that comes up often is cellulitis. Um, have a high index of suspicion for it. Uh, if you're seeing fever or you're seeing any signs of infection and you don't have any obvious clues to what it is, ask the patient if they have any uh, rashes or patches or places that are just inflamed. Um, both uh, conditions kind of require longer term hospital care or medical care uh, that we really provide in the pre-hospital environment. But there's a couple of uh, things that get in the way of seeking treatment daily for that kind of condition. Uh, do contacts undergo the common cold? I'm not sure. Uh, sometimes my patient contacts have the under cold, the common cold, but uh, coughs, colds, um, droplets. Um, there's bacterial and viral pneumonia, both of which require different treatments. I'm not sure what, quite what you mean by do contacts undergo the common cold? Okay. Um, so while these conditions might generally be able to be treated at, uh, at primary care with a course of antibiotics, there's often an issue with compliance with medication. Say you get robbed or mugged, uh, or you have to be at a shelter early to ensure you have a bed. It can be hard to make it up to the hospital to get it hospital every day to get a course of antibiotics or even keep up with an oral dose. Uh, to this end, I suggest doing a little legwork on your part, uh, finding out what the local shelter situations are like. Uh, you can't just <laughs> dump on, off all the work up to social work at the hospital. They have their plate full already and knowing a little bit about it beforehand can be really helpful. So find out what's accessible at all hours. Uh, so if someone decides that they don't want treatment, they have a place to stay. Uh, and if they don't have a place to stay, see if you can help them. It's, uh, it goes a long way to developing a relationship in the community. If you know that the shelter has a curfew, like a lot of shelters don't accept residents after 10 or 11 PM. So find a few shelters that you, are, that you know are all open at all hours of the day and learn if they have any restrictions on them. Some shelters are known as what are called, uh, all are known as what is uh, called a high barrier shelter, which might not tolerate drugs, alcohol, or intoxication. So it precludes a lot of potential transports to those locations or residents going to those locations. Um, some locations, mostly in older buildings like the downtown east side, uh, aren't wheelchair accessible or aren't mobility scooter accessible. So you need to find places that are actually gonna be useful for those people because there are many people that live on the street who are, are in wheelchairs or on scooters, have mobility issues. If you have to send them up three or four steps, steps they won't go because it's not useful for them. It's not an actual, Excuse me, close that window. Um, another thing to consider is if a shelter is trans inclusive or not. Uh, some of the shelters in Vancouver aren't trans exclusive or tra aren't trans inclusive and might not be safe for a trans person to go to. Um, so this is a lot, of know, lot to know off the top of your head and not something I would necessarily like say, you must know everything before you go into it, but um, there's often a lot of resources online for your community. Like there's a BC, on the BC housing website, there's locations, a list of shelters in all around BC. Um, and there's also like the, there's different resource networks that are available. So not maybe print out a copy of the pamphlet just to have in your kit or add it somewhere safe to hold on to, or just have the site bookmarked on your phone. So that way at two in the morning when someone's like, I don't want to go to the hospital, I just don't need a place to stay. 
You can send them to the woman shelter that's open 24 hours that accepts intoxicated patients or the emergency shelter that accepts patients any time of day. So being flexible is required in treatment of the unhoused. Consider what your base goals are when you're called to help out. Our job as healthcare providers is not to judge people or police people's lives outside the required duties to report, such as in senior or youth abuse or neglect. Listen to what it is they are really asking for and seeing what you can do to help. One thing I want to mention for people going to shelters and that need a place to stay is it's really useful to know if a place has secure storage. Um, if people have a cart or a lot of possessions with them, if they're told they can't bring them with them, the shelter is not useful for them. Um, occasionally there are locations in the city, not just shelters, but that are uh, open use shower locations at certain times of day. So like in Vancouver off of Carroll Street, there's a soccer field pitch that's pretty much in use all the time. But the far end of that is a shower unit where people can go and shower, which is something that people need to do, especially if they want to apply for jobs or get into a place. They can't necessarily show up looking and smelling like they haven't showered in five days because they haven't showered in five days. Um, locations that accept pets. Um, some of these people, that pet is their entire world and they wouldn't, they wouldn't abandon them. And that's a problem when you need people to go up to the hospital and they're like, hey, my dog's here. I can't leave my dog. So you're given a question of, do you have anyone that can go with you? Or you find the, the primary care providers in the community that will work in that community. So you can say, hey, I know you don't want to go up to the hospital right now. I know that's not going to work for you. But there is that place on Cordova. It's like five blocks from here. Uh, can, we get, can you get over there or can we help you get there? So know what's around um, and know what people really want. Yeah, like um, I'm not getting into war stories, but sometimes it's like, yes, they require treatment. No, they won't take their dog. No, you can't, you can't transport them against their will and you wouldn't want to anyways, but what are you gonna do? So I'm gonna talk, speak a little bit about IV drug use. Uh, we're still in the middle of the opioid epidemic that continues to have an increasing body count. Safer use locations have done a great job in preventing increased loss of life and preventing community, split, uh, community spread of diseases due to shared needle use. Uh, despite common thought, um, having a safe injection site decreases the number of needles found in the wild as there's now a safe disposal site. Um, and this is a high risk demographic for HIV and Hep C. Uh, so let's spend some time talking about those disease processes. Uh, HIV or human immunodeficiency virus is a bloodborne virus that is common in people who inject IV drugs. This does not always develop into AIDS and it's only hazardous to healthcare providers in the event of a needle stick or an active bleed. It's not going to be spread by saliva. So if you have someone, for example, spit in your eye, you aren't likely to get HIV. Actually, it's impossible. So um, after, and even if you are exposed to HIV through a needle stick or some sort of uh, glove tear bleed accident, um, there is a treatment called uh, post-exposure prophylactic. Now that's hard for me to say because I stutter a little bit, but if that medication is started within 72 hours of an HIV exposure, it's very, very likely to prevent contracting the virus. There's also what is known as post-exposure prophylactic or PrEP, or sorry, pre-exposure prophylactic PrEP. Um, it is often referred to by a trade name of Truvada. There's also other variants out there now. Uh, I was going to say Laverna, but that's a brand of laptop. Um, this medication prevents people from contracting HIV with an extremely high degree of success if taken correctly. Uh, this is a common medication associated amongst gay men and has really come into prevalence in the last few years. There are some risks associated with this medication, uh, including uh, issues with kidney function, which means that this medication requires blood work every three months, as well as regular STI screening. Um, it's been huge in stopping the transmission of HIV in community without, even without, without IV drug use. However, it is something that you consider if people are engaging in dangerous or risky behavior, like sharing needles. Like ideally, yes, you'll be, they'll be using a safe injection site, but in, when COVID, when the shelters have reduced hours or the OPS site has reduced hours, it's not necessarily as feasible. Um, so if they have a community healthcare provider that can set them up with, uh, the medication is available for free out of St. Paul's right now. You just have to have a G or your doctor recommend you to it. So for engaging in high risk activity. And while there is no, uh, no cure for HIV, there, is, there are solid medication regimens, including antiretroviral, antiretroviral treatment 
that can reduce a patient's viral load to zero. And if a patient has a zero viral load, they have no chance of passing the virus to anyone else via sexual contact. So there's an edu educational campaign around this right now. Uh, it's commonly known as undetectable uh, is tr untransmissible, sometimes referred to as U equals U. So uh, hepatitis C is another uh, bloodborne disease that is very common among people who use IV drugs. There is a vaccine against hep A and B, but no vaccine against hep C. Um, it can, however, now be treated and cured. Um, the process that goes that <laughs> to cure it follows that. The process to cure is you need follow up with your GP. You need, so you have to get them set up at the clinic or a hospital, and it also requires sobriety in a lot of cases. Uh, because hep C in, um, in, impacts liver function, you really want to make sure that it's going to be well so they don't need a transplant right after. Um, this is a relatively new development. Uh, I know that Nick and I were lucky enough to meet providers uh, talking about it in Victoria when I was over on the island working there. Um, in an overdose situation, uh, so someone overdoses on opiates, please oxygenate your patients before administering Narcan. Uh, the breathing is the most important part, and if a patient wakes up hypoxic, they are likely to be confused and potentially aggressive. Uh, do you give the Narcan enough time to work before administering a, a second dose? Um, as large amounts of Narcan could cause a patient to go into withdrawal and make them go dope sick, which can be very unpleasant for them. If they find out that you've made them dope sick, if, if they're throwing up all over the place because you push too much Narcan, um, they're going to be pissed. And Sorry, they're going to be mad at you. And they're going to be understandably mad at you because they feel absolutely terrible. They also spent a lot of money, a lot of money to them getting this, these drugs. And there's an issue around consent here where they have the right to do drugs. It's their body, it's their purpose. Like they, they've chosen to do that and we've taken that away from them. Yes, we've done so in the purpose of providing life-saving interventions, but we're not, but it's their choice. And that's why we don't we also don't do it unless it's absolutely necessary, right? If someone has a decreased LOC because of, the, uh, because of heroin or fentanyl, yes, we will intervene. But otherwise, they are allowed, they can, you can wander around high on the streets if they wanted to. We don't have the option just to dart them because. Uh, so I spoke with Nick a little bit about this before we got started. And uh, hopefully in the future, you'll get a chance to talk with someone from TransBC. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about providing care for trans folk. Um, uh, trans people can also, also exist in all these other categories as well, IV drug users, unhoused, um, and they still face a large amount of discrimination in Canada. They're often denied work, harassed, and not accepted by their families. This leads to many of them living on the downtown east side and turning to street level sex work to survive. A quick note here, uh, sex worker is generally the preferred term rather than prostitute or hooker. Those are, those are both pejorative. Um, while speaking to trans people, I'd like to encourage you to use whatever name they give you. <laughs> Their birth name or dead name as it is often referred can be a painful reminder that they are not seen as who they, th they really are. It may come up in documentation, especially at hospitals or other institutions. Please remind the staff uh, of their current name uh, so their dead name isn't shouted across emerged by the unit clerk. So use their pronouns, it's not really difficult. Um, I choose to introduce myself with, uh, my name is Chris, here are my pronouns, he and him. I didn't do it this time because I forgot, but I sign my emails off with it. I sign all my messaging services off with that. So that is just a way to normalize introducing your pronouns to a conversation. Um, if you ask pronouns only when you see trans people, it really obviously points them out that they're not passing or that you've clocked them, which is not necessarily received very well. So perhaps consider not doing that. Um, just start doing it daily around people you know, uh, see, and just integrate it to your daily practice. And if you make a mistake or misgender someone, um, correct yourself and move on. Don't make a big issue of it, which just makes the situation more difficult than it needs to be. Trust me on that one. Don't make a big deal about it. So trans people have often had severely unpleasant medical experiences uh, and are often distrustful of our medical system. Some of their medical concerns have been written off as being related to them being trans or taking hormones. The name for this amongst the community is referred to as broken arm syndrome. 
where they go to see a doctor to get their broken arms that are looked at and the doctor immediately jumps to them to, about them being on hormones and speaks to them about taking them, getting off hormones. Now, uh, these hormones are occasionally uh, illegally procured. So they're found on the internet in the same way that bodybuilders grow up by steroids. So there's the question about quality there, what they're really getting. Uh, that, isn't, that is a concern, uh, but not necessarily for us. If we see a patient, they're saying, hey, my chest hurts. Well, do they take, do they take testosterone? Maybe. Well, what, what's the pathology of that chest pain? Let's find out. Let's not immediately jump to that being the necessarily number one cause. They could have an underlying cardiac condition. They could have done cocaine. They could have done cocaine as being like, hey, why is this, th this thing we just did hurting my chest? That's interesting. Let's find out. Or pneumonia. So uh, one more thing to think about with trans men is that um, trans men can be pregnant. Um, if you have a male presenting patient who is pregnant, please be respectful and don't be weird about it. That's kind of all they need. Uh, many institutions are exclusive to this group uh, and can be, it can be a sensitive subject. An easy change in, um, sorry, it's a long time talking. An easy change in language about this is saying people who get pregnant or people who menstruate. Um, it's a minor change in dialogue and it keeps people, it keeps the conversation inclusive. It really like, it shows that you're not, that you think of them as people, uh, as part of your demographic. Um, so I'd like to have a little conversation about uh, indigenous patients and acknowledge, oh, okay, that's a good question. How do I deal with the paperwork side for trans patients? Um, so if I'm, if I'm on car and I, get, I'll, I have them give me their, uh, their care card to record their information as, as received, and then I go have a chat with the, the unit clerk while I hand them in. Um, the same way that if someone has a nickname, I put it in quotes because that's what you refer to them as. So say you, uh, someone hands my care card over to the nurse and says, hey, his name's Chris Ross. Um, there's air quotes Ryan around it because that's my middle name. He goes by Ryan. He won't answer to Chris. It's kind of like that. It's like, it's just a preference thing. Um, and many tra like trans people can get their care card and their ID updated. There are issues around um, the system not necessarily updating correctly, but the point is every point of contact you make along the way, when you introduce that patient, you say, hi, this is their name, like their, their, their name, their chosen name. Um, these are their pronouns. Uh, that way it prevents them going, hey, like Richard, where's Richard? And the, the person does not want to identify that, does not necessarily want to be outed as being trans in a public location, because that's actually a safety issue as well. Um, you, you can note, um, if you're on car, you can note just in like the notes section. Um, yep, patient's name is blah. Patient goes by blah. Just like make sure you really uh, keep close track of it. Chris, if Are I can just other... jump in really fast here, but just because I, uh, um, uh, my own, and this is just me maybe oversharing here, but my own personal practice is that I normally try to just acknowledge, uh, and I'm going to turn my video on here. Um, I normally try to, you know, I get a person's name from them, and if if they're trans or if they've identified as trans or um, I'm aware that they're trans, I normally ask, you know, or I normally phrase things in, in a way that, that sort of is, you know, hey, I understand this is your chosen name right now. What name and sex am I going to find you in the hospital computer as? Because it's a really, really um, there's zero judgment attached to that. It's like, I just need to find you in a database and I totally get that that database probably doesn't match who you are right now, but I still have to find you in my stupid computer or, or whatever. Um, and that, I, and I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, but that's a, to me has been a very successful and well-received uh, strategy with, uh, with trans folk. Yeah. I find that's actually really useful. Um, it acknowledges them as a person. It acknowledges that they exist in a computer system and we all know that computers don't necessarily work the way we want them to. Sometimes names don't update them the way they want them to. But you know, <laughs> that's, uh, <laughs> that's just kind of the way it is. Computers are uh, finicky and have a mind of their own sometimes. So, um, and I think we're gonna have a question and answer period right at the end of this chat. So uh, I, can, I can take questions then um, if you want. I also just wanna acknowledge that this is the most I've spoken at a time in probably months now. <laughs> it's, uh, 
to it is a big adjustment, right? Um, so I'd like to have a do a brief section about uh, indigenous patients. And I'd also like to acknowledge that I <laughs> I am a white man doing a conversation about a racialized group. Uh, I am not a, like this is not my lived experience, and this is not necessarily something I can speak to personally. Um, so indigenous patients in BC face systemic discrimination on a large scale. Uh, there's been re recent studies on this, uh, in, like from the provincial healthcare system that have determined, yes, there is a large bias against indigenous patients, uh, along with intense medical racism during the residential school system. Um, a lot of indigenous patients do not trust the medical system. You need to listen to these patients and understand uh, what they're speaking or that they know what they're speaking about when they're referring to their own conditions. Um, there was a recent study done in America that revealed a portion of practicing physicians believe that black patients experienced less or different pain than white patients, leading to withholding pain control and other ne necessary treatments. Carbonated water was not a good choice. Um, healthcare providers need to check their own biases when it comes to Indigenous patients. And additional education regarding uh, indigenous specific care should be sought out um, by providers. Uh, one thing to know is that you should find out what the communities near your, where you practice is. Um, a recent piece of practice update for me was not referring to uh, indigenous uh, communities as reserves. Uh, if you refer to them as reserves, they have those, um, there's a bias that goes into that. There's a preconception. Uh, having worked on the island, when people were going to reserves, um, there was an attitude that got caught to it. Um, these are patients with complicated, these, these can be patients with complicated medical conditions. <laughs> Treat them politely, learn, learn, from, like, learn, to, learn, learn to become involved in these community. Don't just act upon them. Um, if we keep acting upon them uh, and imposing things top down, um, we don't actually get the value of the community. We don't actually serve them. We're doing things for them. It's, uh, it's a little different and it's a little hard to articulate. Uh, one, I should just talk with my hands more. It makes me more comfortable. Um, one thing that I have been told is that when an indigenous person does go to the hospital, oftentimes their family will collect uh, their most well-spoken people and have them dress up so they're taken seriously. Because often when they're entered into a merge, or they're entering care, they're, seen, they're not seen as being taken seriously. People ignore what they're saying and they, they look to obvious conditions. Sort of like the, the trans broken arm syndrome, they look for intoxication, they look for diabetes. They don't actually look at what's possibly going on there. They just jump to preconceived notions about what is what, what was probably happening there. Um, I'm, try, I'm not gonna get into war stories too much, but um, when I was up north, uh, they had a patient who was just like, um, abdo pain, uh, miscellaneous, had fallen off a deck, whatever. And they were brushed off and sedated overnight. And they're like, oh, well, we'll just deal with this in the morning. Uh, it turns out um, when she had fallen, she was going, going outside to urinate and had a ruptured bladder. Uh, we found that out um, after transporting her to a different city four hours away um, without a nurse escort to ensure uh, proper sedation. Um, that's on me. I should have, I like now looking back on that, I would have double checked the longevity of that sedation, making sure that the pain wasn't going, she wasn't going to wake up halfway across and be in pain for the rest of the trip because the anesthetic had worn off. Like it's, it's all sorts of mistreatment at all levels of care. And it's something that we can all look at as healthcare practitioners to reach out and actually help. I think it's uh, uh, working for who I work for. I'm provided with uh, education opportunities from the Provincial Health Services Authority, uh, the Sunniest Indigenous Health, or er, Indigenous Cultural Safety Program, which is now going to be mandatory for all employees on hire. Um, it's a great place to start. Um, you work with people around the province who are also taking the course, who are also talking about their own biases and experiences. Um, and a lot of people when I was doing that course were saying, I don't believe that the Indigenous people have, are treated worse. Um, if we want an example of this currently, up in Coastal Health, um, in Bella Coola, when the vaccine was being rolled out, there's an issue there where uh, the director of that vaccine rollout uh, said, hey, we're, we need to roll out this vaccine overnight. You have until 10, 10 a.m. To, uh, to find a plan to distribute the vaccine in, our, in your community. 
so, and he also referred to it as being a gift from the provincial government rather than a life-saving treatment that's necessary for all, all residents of BC. So when they sent in the plan at 10.01 in the morning, uh, he said it was too late. He packed up the vaccine and uh, took it back to Vancouver, which is a complete overstep of his authority and also an inappropriate treatment. Um, I think one big thing I want to uh, raise the point of is people need to be, you need to be flexible in your care of marginalized people. You can't just be like, hey, I do the same call for job Bob, <laughs> Bob, Joe, and Dean every week um, downtown. I'm going to do it in every other situation. Um, there have been times where I've worked with people and I've had to wait around for a long time, just hang out on scene with people. Is the most exciting thing to do? No, but it is what's required. It's you need to take the time and earn the trust of these populations, um, make their lives easier because they're already having a pretty bad day if they need medical care, right? No one wants to go to the hospital. No one wants to see a paramedic. Like when you wake up in the morning, no one plans to get injured. So make it easier for people. Listen, it's like if you're at a, if if you're at an old woman's house and you, she's like, hey, can you make a cup of tea for me, I, I just need a hand in bed. You make the cup of tea. It takes a little time and it makes everyone more comfortable and makes their day a little bit better. Sometimes it's more work and oh, a lot of times it's more work, but it's something to consider. I'd like to briefly talk about patients with mental illnesses. Um, the mental health um, healthcare system in BC is, it's trying its best. It is underfunded and it's under-resourced. Um, these are patients that require special care and attention, uh, and these patients are often familiar with the medical system if their condition isn't new. Uh, people with long-term depression and suicidal ideation or suicide attempts or um, schizophrenia, they, they know what's going to happen when they're going to treatment. This can lead them to being unwilling to go to seek treatment because they know what's going to happen when they get there. Again, carbonated water, not a great choice. Um, if they think, oh yeah, I'm gonna get sent to chairs for, and I'm gonna be sent to wait for a 72 hour psych hold, that might be the case. So what do we do for these patients? We take them to care, because um, especially if they've expressed suicidal ideation with, then we have to, then they're going to the hospital. They're going for an assessment, but what else can we do? What is causing this most recent crisis? Is it just a baseline chronic depression condition? Is it major depressive disorder? Or is there a signifying event? Um, are they feeling isolated? Are they feeling uh, scared because they're unhoused? Uh, are they coming off like a five day uh, bender? Because if they are, they're gonna be in a, a terrible mood anyways. Um, so take the time to listen to these patients and find out what's really going on with them. And this is another time when I'd recommend um, learning about additional resources in your area. Um, in Victoria, like in Vancouver, um, there is a detox center. So if someone's going to detox, they don't necessarily need to do that all on their own. They can find a, like an inpatient detox center where they don't have, they can go and just be around people, be around care, uh, have people treat their symptoms. Uh, if they're worried about going into withdrawal or going into having a seizure because of withdrawal, Know that, you know, get them in touch with people that can make that process easier for them, less difficult. Um, another note is that these patients are much more likely to be the victim of violence rather than the perpetrators of violence. So going in with that, uh, that perception, like, oh, I don't know what they're gonna do, oh, they could hurt me. They could, but so could any one of your other patients. You don't need to go like in with kid, kid gloves and just be like, oh, I don't know what I can do with this person. I don't know if I should trust them. Have a high index of suspicion with all your patients. Think about why you're there. See if see if they want you to be there first. Um, that's a big big thing. It's and I, I've harped on this a couple of times now. Is that what I really want to get across to people is listen to the patient and not just their symptoms. Treat the patient, not the number. I'm sure we've heard that enough times already as healthcare providers, but. The numbers don't tell you the whole story, the patient does. Um, there's a, um, one thing I did wanna mention is be very clear about, um, so if you have to report something, say senior abuse, child abuse, um, 
or if a, a child is telling you something or a uh, <laughs> someone's like, hey, I'm, I, I was thinking about hurting myself. Explain to them what, what you're going to do. Um, don't mislead people. Don't lie to them. You can tell them like, if, if you were to tell me that you were going to hurt yourself, I am going to put you, I'm going to have to report that and I'm going to, have to take you to the hospital. And that's, that honesty helps build trust. So the next time they come around and they tell you what's actually going on, because if you like, if you tell a kid that, oh yeah, don't worry, CPS is going to take you away and he ends up getting taken away. Are they ever going to trust med the medical system again? So you need to be really clear about what you're going to do. And be honest, help people. Um, I know I say that a lot, but um, help, dealing with marginalized communities can be frustrating because there's not necessarily that amount of trust. Um, healthcare providers, especially paramedics, are used to showing up on scenes and be, people being happy to see you. When someone doesn't trust you or doesn't trust authority as a whole, um, that's, that's a baseline challenge that needs to be overcome. With uh, It's a lot of work. Um, I'd like to open up the floor to any questions, if uh, if people like. Does anyone have anything they want to ask, or any thoughts, or any questions about actually uh, the downtown east side in Vancouver? I can help out with. This while folks are coming. Hey, Chris, this is Nick. Um, just while my video takes a second to fire up here, um, uh, I had a couple. Of, just digging back into some of the stuff you were talking with a few minutes ago. Um, you're talking about prophylax, uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis. Mm -hmm. which I, as far as I'm aware, is a cocktail of, of antiretrovirals designed to stop the virus, the, the HIV virus, from, from getting a foothold. Does it have any effect on other um, communicable viral diseases, like any impact on hep C or anything? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Um, I haven't heard of it being prescribed for anything else, really just specifically for HIV. Right. Okay. Um, I, that's a good question, though. Um, I'm just I was just curious to... if it was it had any like you know like off label or secondary effects or anything like that. And I, I, I it's such a, yeah, it's it's such a thing that I'm like I'm just not particularly familiar with it. Mm -hmm. um, Hi, Nick. Uh, oh, yeah. Is Hi, that Brian? It's, it's Brian. I'll I'll jump in here just because I happen to be someone who um, takes prep at certain times uh, depending on what activities I might be doing uh, in a week. Um, PrEP right now, antiretrovirals tend to target a very specific virus just because of the way that they're engineered. There are many different types of uh, retrovirals that exist on the market. Some of them are used for uh, treating different types of viruses that may occur commonplace in the world. Um, so, but the, when people are talking about PrEP, they are talking about retrovirals that target HIV. Uh, and the name of the specific brand name drug escapes me because I, I can't find it in my washroom and it's the first time I've checked in a few weeks. <laughs> is it uh, uh, Truvada? <laughs> yes, yes, it is Truvada, correct. Yeah, that's the one. Uh, and that targets HIV. Fantastic. Or, Thank you very much, Brian. That was a great answer and, and thanks for jumping in there to, to supplement that. Um, Thank you. I don't know if there were other folks with questions for, for Chris. I have, I have two more. I couldn't type, I've got two monitors running right now, one with the chat and everything, and one with the screen, and I couldn't actually type notes as well, so I've been doing post-its. Um, looks like Elizabeth has turned her... I, yeah. <laughs> I do, and I don't know how to type the question. Sorry, Nick. That's okay. That's okay. Um, Go ahead, Elizabeth. Thanks, thanks a lot for what you're talking about. It's, it's, it's really awesome, and it's super important. Um, you did make mention of don't refer to uh, where indigenous people live as reserves. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you tend not to re, um, oh. refer to them as anything or do they prefer- You know, I didn't finish that thought and thank you for pointing that out. Um, I am working with someone who's developing an indigenous safety program with BC Ambulance currently, or sorry, BCHS. And mm -hmm. uh, she is actually saying, uh, refer to them as villages rather than reserves. Uh, it because it's actually where people live. It's their community rather than a place they're put necessarily. It's not like it's it, it feels less less like a zoo. Is was the point? Okay, yeah, villages is great, and thank you. I really appreciate that. And I guess the uh, the next question is how do they? Uh, and I hate to say they because that's bad, but um, the indigenous people. How do they prefer to be? Um, titled like as indigenous or first nations or um like what do they prefer if if you i, I mean need... the problem is is that it's an individual reaction it's not like a uh indigenous is the current preferred term 
Um, okay. It's preferred over Aboriginal. Uh, both terms should be capitalized, I think is the best way to do. And if you're referring to a certain nation, refer to the nation itself. So awesome. if, if okay. rather than saying, hey, uh, Indigenous people in BC, I'm like, hey, the, the Squam I'm dealing with the Squamish nation today and be specific. Okay, and, and I know that they, um, one thing that I I've found that has um, really helped with patient treatment is, is just asking where they're from, because that then opens up where their family is from and where, because often they're, they're not from where you're seeing them, they're, they come from, you know, further north or they have family members elsewhere. And so that I've found is, is really a, a, a good opener. That's a great conversational piece and I totally agree with you. It, it's a more human connection than, all right, <laughs> like you're not, your neck doesn't hurt, you're not bleeding anywhere, your airways clear, you're speaking full sentences. Hey, what, what, what medical conditions do you have? Like it's a more, it's a more human conversation. Uh, yeah. And I, I'm sorry. No, I just, just yeah, I've, I've found that and, and thank you very much. Uh, I saw we had a conversation in the chat from, uh, uh, from uh, from Naomi there. Uh, and what is the inaction that provincial government could further implement that would most benefit opioid users? Um, again, I don't represent the views of my organization, um, and I'm just going to speak for myself here. Um, Dr. Bonnie Henry a few years ago spoke about decriminalizing all drugs. Um, not necessarily like safe supply is the most important step in providing people with like safe drugs. So if someone's like, hey, I want to use cocaine or hey, I want to uh, use Oxycontin for my pain control then they're not going to get accidentally dosed with fentanyl. That's kind of like one of the like the most concrete steps that can be taken. The province seems actually really in favor of this. It's kind of up to the federal level now to determine whether it should be criminalized or not. Uh, we're not seeing any action on the federal level on that, but that is something that should be done. Um, uh, another thing that should be considered is um, subsidized, or by subsidized, I mean free housing. Um, if you give people a place to live, it's shown, there have been studies done that have proven it decreases crime and decreases um, hospitalization and decreases drug use. It just removes a lot of the stress people are under uh, on their day-to-day -day life. Um, and to speak to that, a little, uh, to speak on that stress a, fur a little bit further, um, it's known that childhood trauma is a pretty strong indicator of um, car complex PTSD as a pretty common um, recurrent uh, condition in people who use IV drugs. Um, I see Bryce has their hand raised. Uh, Bryce, do you wanna mute yourself? Oh, sorry there, man. I must have pushed the number. Oh, you got anything you want to ask? Uh, no. No, it's everything looks really interesting for, for us. That's very interesting. I I come back. I'm actually part of that population that you're talking about. And it's, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Thanks, yeah, it's very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, Mila sent me a uh, uh, sent me something. I think it was meant to be a question. So uh, there is a difference between uh, where you where you're from, uh, sir. Where are you from and where do you live? That's that's a very important point. If you ask, hey, where do you live? It's like, yeah, I live in Surrey. So that doesn't really tell you much about me currently, except that I probably commute into town and I don't like Fridays. Um, so where, where are you from is a more, it's more, it needs to be a more conscious question. You need to be like, hey, where are you from? In that case, we can say like, hey, I, I kind of consider myself an island guy. I lived there for a decade. Uh, many of my close friendships and my relationships are from there. So that gives you a more a whole picture of who I am as a person than like, yeah, I live in town and I drive, I spend, oh God, a lot of time commuting a week. Um, does anyone else have any questions?
Nick, I think you mentioned you had one more. Um, I just, uh, it was just, a, it, I'm not sure if they were questions per se, as more just observations. You touched on um, on trans people and, and sort of safety and stuff um, and, you know, access to shelter and housing. Uh, I, I wanted to, uh, to just uh, let everyone know that what we'll try and do it uh, when we post this to YouTube, um, A, we'll try and post a bunch of links to local resources for at least some of the major urban centers in BC. So Victoria, Vancouver, um, I think uh, Kamloops or Kelowna, if I can, if I can find stuff easily. So those are, those are going to be available. Um, I wanted to touch on really briefly, or, or just you know, uh, um, get your input, Chris. I know I've I've heard a lot of women identify that shelters are particularly dangerous places for them, and I would assume for trans people, um, especially so. Um, and you know, maybe just a reminder that for for some folks, I, I, I've heard a lot of rhetoric, both from uh, from. Uh, other frontline workers in a variety of fields and, and from members of the general public that, you know, like, well, there's shelter space available if people want it. Um, and just to maybe reemphasize uh, that, you know, put, putting vulnerable people into large dark rooms with, uh, uh, you know, lots of, you know, potentially, uh, potentially other very needy and, and desperate people can be a recipe for disaster a lot of times. So I just want to, I just want to make sure that got to, got touched on as well. Yeah, for um, sure. That's a really important point, Nick. Um, there's one more uh, consideration for shelters that I wanted to bring up before I forget. Um, there's only one shelter in Vancouver where uh, a woman can stay with her, her son if he is above 15. So if, if there's a family looking for shelter for the night, that's an important, uh, Thing to know is that there's some shelters that won't take a whole family unit. I don't actually know if we have anywhere in Victoria that will. I'm pretty sure it's just a like first come first serve and if person one is first and person two is after the cutoff. I'm not sure to be honest. I'd have to look into that. Uh, uh, the city, of, uh, I know the city of Vancouver has a children's shelter that they don't necessarily advertise super well. Um, you kind of have to go looking for it. Um, like it doesn't have the Covenant House uh, publicity. But Covenant House is actually a high barrier shelter where they won't accept anyone that's intoxicated. Um, so they, it might be something like the city of Victoria or, or Saanich has a resource that's just like not super publicized. Something to look into for sure. Yeah, it's possible. I really would, I would have to go looking for that. I know we have, um, I know low barrier shelter space is a really big challenge around here, um, especially post, uh, post or during COVID. Um, yeah. It, it's it's very difficult for people who are uh, under the influence of anything um, or, or having behavioral issues. Um, it's very difficult for those folks to find a place to, uh, to, to have a roof over their head for a night, so. All right, uh, so Mila, are there any prescribed drugs that mix badly with street drugs in a particular way? Um, MDMA um, works, uh, has a very, very negative interaction with, um, SSRIs and NR, NR, SNRIs, um, it can cause a, <laughs> a very bad serotonin syndrome. Um, details off the top of my head, uh, not super clear on the, the like the mechanic, the or pharmacokinetics of it, um, but a very dangerous combination. Um, amyl nitrates, uh, small bars of what's called poppers, uh, have a very negative effect with a, um, Cialis, uh, Levitra, or any of those erectile dysfunction medications. Um, occasionally, uh, women are on them for uh, heart conditions um, because your blood pressure uh, bottom out. So that's a very like I haven't encountered that in the street, um, but it does. It can occur. Um, <laughs> I, I have I have actually seen at least one unconscious patient who mixed poppers with their uh, with their uh, Viagra and. You know. Well, it's very upsetting for for all the folks involved. Then. <laughs> it's sorry, I shouldn't laugh, but it's a, it's a bad day. Like again, like um, hopefully most people who are dabbling with street drugs are at least passingly aware of interactions with their medications. But and there are websites out there that'll actually uh, say, is my medication safe with X? Uh, and the problem with street drugs is that you don't know what you're getting. Uh, that's another point where safe supply is important. So say theoretically say i'm doing cocaine but it's been a mixed cut with mdma or something weird uh and it was interacting with my s uh 
SSRI, there we are. God, that's a mouthful. Um, I wouldn't have known that was going to happen. But if I knew I was just taking cocaine right off the shelf, like <laughs> pure cocaine, um, then I wouldn't have had that same interaction. Chris, I just wanted to jump in really fast and, and touch on two things. Pete Thompson, uh, uh, who's one of our members here in Victoria, just had a very great note, but it kind of got buried under the attendance stuff there. Um, he just commented that our most important roles with street folks and other patient contacts can be one of caring advocacy with a system that all too often, for a variety of reasons, is inclined to write them off. And, and I think that's bang on, Pete. Like, there's so many people have such terrible experiences with the system, and I put big air quotes, the system, um, you know, that, that stretches across, uh, you know, healthcare, law enforcement, emergency care, shelters, all this stuff um, that, that, you know, one of the biggest things you can do is show up and don't be a jerk, right? Like, and people, my experience has been that, you know, as long as you're making a genuine effort to not be, we talked a lot about different terminology and what words to use and not use and stuff like that. Please try and remember those. But, you know, most people that I've ever met are very receptive. If you use an incorrect word and someone corrects you or you realize it afterwards and say, sorry, people go, oh, you're actually trying, thanks. Like it's normally just making the effort that, that is, and like recognizing um, recognizing that that's, uh, you know, a thing that is worthy of being cared for. Um, one, of my, one, of my, uh, one of my work colleagues, and I, I won't use his name here because I don't know if he'd want to be publicly flagged for this, um, but, uh, but he has a great mantra that, that he takes into every call and he just says dignity and respect for everyone. Um, and at the end of the day, I think that'd probably be a really good way to paraphrase the last hour, hour and a bit of, of talk is, is dignity and respect for everyone. Make the best effort you can to, to provide those things. And uh, it's very difficult to go wrong if you're, if you're really making an effort at that stuff. Um, Chris, I don't know if you have any closing, any closing stuff or any more. I, I, I feel like the questions are tapering out. If folks yeah. have more questions, now is the time. Um, uh, I, I just want to give a, give a shout out and thank you for uh, having me speak today. It's a real honor to come and speak with you all. Um, really appreciate it. Well, absolutely, um, Chris. It's been fantastic for us to have you here as well. It's, 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 it's you know, uh, this sort of stuff, it's very difficult. It's very often not taught in school and classes and courses. It's sidelined and turned into a, you know, a, an end of the day, 20 minute discussion. Um, and it's, it's so important. This stuff is, is, you know, sometimes more important than the clinical stuff we do very often. So um, thank you so much. Uh, I see a couple of people saying thanks in the chats here as well. So um, thanks just... very much, Chris and Nick. I really appreciate your, um, your time and your comments. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe we'll just give it just to, just as we taper off here, folks. We'll just give it a minute. Just we sometimes have folks who are uh, a little slower on typing than than speed demons that are the rest of us. So, uh, <laughs> any questions? Your uh, your line "Don't be a jerk" is really kind of it's it's very key. <laughs> it's, be nice that, to your patients. <laughs> it, that that really sums it up is don't be don't be a jerk to people because they're different than you. Don't be a jerk to people because they're struggling with different issues than you. Just don't be a jerk. Yeah. And, and try and understand that that you know stuff that might come easy to you it might be because you've actually had it really lucky and been born with a lot of privilege or had a lot of privilege. And just because just because you maybe didn't have a lot of privilege and, and came through your own challenges doesn't mean that other people don't have different challenges or the same challenges and and all uh, and all that sort of thing. Um, uh, there's a good question from Pete here, maybe. Uh, uh, Pete notes. So Chris, I don't know, I think I talked to you about this a little bit before, Chris, but uh, one of the roles that St. John here in Victoria does, uh, pre-COVID at least, is we spent, uh, we spent a lot of time uh, running street clinics at uh, local, uh, local street warming shelters and shelter spaces and housing facilities. Um, and Pete noted that, you know, with our experience there, minor wound care and often major care is a very common need of the street community um, with abscesses, cellulitis, MRSA, um, MRSA is a methicillin resistant staph infection um, that there's lots of work to do and there's a major need of the marginalized folks uh, to get access to this stuff. Um, Absolutely. Have, yeah. The minor wound care is a, a total nightmare because you, you leave it for a couple days and it gets really, really bad real quick. And with MRSA, it's super contagious too. So like <laughs> the last yeah, thing it, you want. 
it's it's really rough. I mean, one of one of the things that we were very surprised by with our street clinics here in Victoria was that one of the more common things we'd see, we found that we we you know right off the bat we had a lot of people asking for blood pressure monitoring and blood sugar monitoring, mm -hmm. and then right after that was minor wound care, and a significant portion of the minor wound care uh, was actually post operative surgical site care, because if you have the surgery done you only get to stay in the hospital normally for a day or two afterwards, and then you're discharged home. Uh, oh, it looks like I, am I still visible, Chris? Yeah, you're still visible. I just got a, you have been signed out on a Zoom here. I'm not sure what's going on. So we're going to wrap up real quick before this. All right, sounds great. <laughs> um, but, um, but yeah, we found that a lot of people needed surgical care um, and, uh, or post-operative surgical care because they were, they'd had surgery and they had nowhere to go. Um, with that, folks, I think we'll we'll call it a night. Unless uh, Chris, if you have any closing comments or anything, no, just uh, you all take care now. And I've, it's been a real honor to uh, talk to you guys tonight. So, and thank you so much, Chris, for all your time on this. It was a great presentation. I really appreciate it. Take right. care, man. Have a good night. Bye.